day-to-day decisions are easy, but life-changing choices are tough. There are times we struggle, calculating and recalculating which direction to go. We try to map out our lives. Who should I marry? What job should I take? What's my purpose? We start wishing there was a GPS for life. But God doesn't want us wandering. He wants to guide you through the different turns of life. He knows you better than you know yourself. And He has uniquely designed a route for you. Divine Direction all right, well, good morning, everybody. Great to see you guys. I want to welcome you to Liquid Church. I'm Tim. I serve as a uh, lead pastor here. And we have multiple campuses kind of all around New Jersey joining us and also Church Online. Would you welcome all of them? We're really glad you guys are here with us today. Welcome to you. Really cool to have you. We're in this uh, series called Divine Direction, which is really kind of all about learning to discern God's will in these key areas of our life. We know 2018 is going to be a decisive year for many of you. Like, you know, is this the year we, you know, actually buy a house or, or you know, we uh, feel God at, you know, leading me to go back to school or complete my degree or, you know, should I break up with him or do I stick it out, you know, with her? Or maybe it's a, it's a job change or career kind of crossroads that you're facing. We want to download God's divine direction, these key areas of our life. And what's been kind of fun is I've heard a few of you say, man, I felt like God gave me a lot of clarity about my next step. Um, This week I heard from a uh, a man in our congregation, young husband and father, uh, who uh, said, you know, Tim, I have a real passion uh, for teaching the Bible. He actually works with some of our students. He said, I felt like God telling me I need to go back to get more training. And so I actually enrolled in seminary. Uh, last week, he enrolled online, which was awesome, right? Really, really cool. He said, you know, my, I've got a lot of kids of my own. I don't know where it's going to lead, but I'm going to take that next step. If you remember, our anchor verse for this series is Proverbs 16, verse 9. It says, we can make our what? Plans, but the Lord determines our steps. Very di- two different things. We said long-term plans, the 20-year plan, can be overrated, you know? Most often, God's Spirit directs us by just giving us enough light so that we can take the next step. I heard this week from a woman who's a photographer, and uh, God blessed her career in 2017. She said, Tim, it was crazy. She goes, all this business came pouring in. She says, but I got a problem. I run the business out of my house, and my husband is also, he kind of, he has a mobile office out of our house too. So we've got two little girls, two businesses running out of our house, and we're wondering, should we expand our family? Should we have a third kid? And I was like, no, you know, (laughs) because I'm practical, right, you know? But she's like, you know, we were actually praying about it, and we felt like last week the Holy Spirit just gave us this peace about expanding our family. We don't know how it's going to work. We don't know, but we feel this kind of peace come over us. We're on the same page. And so she said, can you pray for a healthy pregnancy? I was like, that's awesome, right? Because the peace of the Holy Spirit often is him testifying that God is taking you in a specific direction, even if you don't know what the next step is. Uh, like he did for the Apostle Paul in the book of Acts. For the last two weeks, what we did is we looked at probably the most spirit-filled Christian in history, the Apostle Paul, and we looked at his missionary journey and then his trip to Rome and see how God kind of ordered his steps. And this week, we're going to look at his uh, companion. Uh, there was Paul reaching the, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, the Romans and everything. We have the Apostle Peter today in Acts chapter 10, who's going to be led by God in a way he didn't expect at first, but leads to this historic breakthrough in the kingdom of God. And so we've been anchoring this series in the book of Acts. I I love Acts. It's kind of like the, you know, action adventure kind of book. It's how the Holy Spirit led the early church to spread the gospel across continents. And uh, to me, it's like watching an action movie because we're part of the, the adventure today. You know, Acts ends in chapter 28. But you and I, we're Acts 29, right? The Spirit is still speaking. The Spirit, Spirit is still giving fresh revelation and purpose and direction to the lives of believers today, amen? And most of that happens through prayer. That's what I want to talk about today, the role of prayer in understanding God's will for your life. It's really through prayer that God does his biggest and his best work, kind of revealing his plan for our lives, charting our course at times changing our perspective and enlarging our heart for his work. But prayer is a tricky subject. What what I've learned is this. When you bring up the subject of prayer, all of us feel like we fall a little bit short, don't we? (laughs) Right? I mean, is there anybody here who's like, man, I'm praying way too much. My prayers are way too powerful, you know, just kind of like, just bam, just answered. That's none of us, right? Including me. 
We, we all need encouragement when it comes to prayer. And uh, I think Acts 10 is going to do that. It's going to inspire you to seek God in a fresh way this week. The Bible promises that God rewards those who earnestly seek him. And prayer is powerful. Prayer is the number one way that your Father in heaven communicates his will to his children on earth. And let's be real. If you don't talk regularly with God, how do you expect to hear from him? Right? Like, how would you expect to receive divine direction? I mean, it's not like God texts, right? I texted God once, you know? He replied, new phone, who dis? Right? <laughs> so let's look at Acts chapter 10. We're going to open up God's word. It's a story about two people praying. Two different prayers on two different days. Hey, it sounds like a mic is on. You guys hear that fumbling around or something? I hope it's just not Kevin using the bathroom backstage. I'm just going to let Ben know that, though, all right? This is Acts chapter 10, and God does something remarkable that's going to change these guys' lives forever, okay? Here's what it says. At Caesarea, there was a man by the name of, what's his name? Cornelius, a centurion in what was known as the Italian Regiment. Now, just to help you visualize this, I want to show you a map. That's where Caesarea is. It's on the coast of the Mediterranean. This is ancient Palestine. This was a port city. And at this moment, Israel's an occupied country. It's, it's, it's conquered by the Romans. And Caesarea is the capital of the Roman province of Judea. And here's what verse 1 says. At Caesarea, this port city, there's a guy named Cornelius, and he's a centurion in the Italian regiment. So this is a military man. This man's in the army, yeah? He's a centurion. Guess how many soldiers he's in charge of? Anybody? A hundred, right? Century, you get it? All right. Jews hated the Romans. They considered them evil Gentiles. They saw them as pagan occupiers. They wanted them out of their country. It's like how we feel about Long Island, you know? <laughs> but Cornelius is different. Even though he's not Christian, verse 2 says this. He and all his family were devout and God-fearing. And he gave generously to those in need. And what did he do? He prayed to God regularly. You know, maybe that's you. You're like, I'm not super religious. I don't necessarily even go to church every, every week, but I, I pray regularly. You know, there's some spiritual vitality. Now, we don't know when Cornelius prayed. We don't know, like, was this in the morning? Did he do it late at night? We don't know how he prayed, like his posture. Did he fold his hands? Did he get on his knees? Did he pace? We don't know, did he pray in the NIV or the KJV? You know what I'm saying? Like the NIV translation of the Bible is like, you know, everyday language, but KJV is these and thous. You know, you ever have someone pray like that? You know, you're like, you think you pray and then you hear them. They're like, oh, thou Lord God, Jehovah, thy will we beseech thee. And you're like, what the? It's like Shakespeare. It doesn't really matter what language you use. The Bible just says Cornelius prayed to God regularly. And here's what I believe if you're taking notes. When you pray regularly, irregular things will happen on a regular basis. I find that when I don't pray, I tend to miss out on what God's doing. But have you noticed that when you pray, coincidences begin to happen? And then all of a sudden you realize they're not really coincidences, they're God incidences. Something happens, we start connecting the dots between kind of what goes on in our day-to-day -day life with what God is doing in heaven and his larger purpose when we pray. Here in Acts 10, Cornelius is praying to God. And verse 3 says this, one day at about what time? Three in the afternoon, he had a vision. He distinctly saw an angel of God who came to him and said, Cornelius, now can I just say, the least likely time for me to have a vision from God is three o'clock in the afternoon. That is when I feel like it is time to take a nap. Anybody else? If I run for president, that will be my public platform. 3 p.m. nationally mandated map, nap time, okay? Three in the air. Yeah, you in there? Okay, here we go. Three in the... That's, that's after lunch, man. Your circadian rhythm is slowing down. Your adrenaline's dipping. I feel like foggy. I'm like, three o'clock, my vision is to go to Starbucks. I'm going to get a cup of coffee so I can finish my work. That's me. I'm just not inspired at three in the afternoon. But lucky for you, God isn't limited by your limitations. When you pray regularly, you just never know when or where or how God's going to show up and download some divine direction that could change the course of your life. That's the story of our church. Do you know that? That's why you're sitting in this room today. I'm preaching from Parsippany. We're sitting in a, a brand new church, and this is kind of a cool story. I mean, it was three years ago. We didn't even know about this place. It was three years ago, we are at Liquid at the Shore. You guys remember that? We had all our campuses under one roof in Ocean Grove, New Jersey. It's a little beach town about, you know, our south and Jersey shore. 
And I, you know, this, was, this was May 2015. And I repeat this story because you know how many new guests we've had since, since Liquid the Shore? Over 7,700 new guests. Like they don't have any memory of this. That's why I'm mentioning this. But Liquid the Shore was the first time we ever spoke the word saturate the state with the gospel of Jesus Christ. We unveiled that, that vision you see it on our wall in Parsippany. And the building you're sitting in right now, we had never been in. We had requested to take a tour of this building, only 40,000 square feet, but the realtor met us in the parking lot and said, I'm so sorry, the owner doesn't want to show it to you because you're a church. And we didn't fight it. We just said, hey, it's New Jersey. That's how it is. You know, closed door, whatever. No isn't negative. And so we'd never been in this building. Now fast forward to Liquid the Shore. We have all of our church under one roof. What are we doing? We're praising God. We're praying to Jesus. And wouldn't you know it, who happened to be on vacation that weekend down in Asbury Park, the realtor of this building? And her daughter wakes up and says, Mom, let's go get bagels in Ocean Grove. And they pedal over, and then they meet one of you kooks, right, wearing a T-shirt. They said, what is this? He said, oh, it's Liquid Church. What? And, they, and we said, come on in. And they came on and stayed for the whole service and saw 4,000 people worshiping. Blew her mind, just blew her away. And that Monday morning, she hopped on the phone with our realtor and said, oh, we want to talk to you about taking the whole building. That's not something man does. That's something the Holy Spirit does. That's three years ago. You could call that a coincidence, but in my heart, I know that's a God incidence. That's a Holy Spirit moment where the, the, the Spirit is ordering the steps of our church. See, when you pray regularly, irregular things will happen in your life on a regular basis. God will give visions. He'll give dreams. He'll put you in contact with people who are needed to take it to the next level, but you never would have met them unless you'd been praying regularly. See, prayer, prayer is like what ignites the favor of God. You guys know what the favor of God is? It's just like the over-the-top, lavish blessing of God on your life beyond anything you deserve. Favor is what happens when God shows up and shows off, like he did for our church in Ocean Grove, which leads to point number two in your notes. Favor is the difference between the best you can do and the best God can do. You can do this much, but when you invite the power of heaven, God can do more than we ask or imagine. And sometimes in response to our feeble little prayers, God will break through and do something that you can't take credit for. He will, he will, he will sh pour out his favor and enlarge your vision. Look what happened to Cornelius. The angel says, Cornelius, and Cornelius stared at him in fear. What is it, Lord, he asked. And the angel answered, your prayers and your gifts to the poor have come up as a what? A memorial offering before God. Let me pause here for just a moment. Memorial. How many of you have been to the 9-11 Memorial in, in Lower Manhattan, okay? Super powerful, right? You need to visit if you haven't. Painful memory, powerful memorial. In, in, in the plaza, there are these two giant voids where the Twin Towers once stood, silent waterfall pouring over the edge into the void, this brass railing covered in the names of all those who perished in the attack. But that's not where the museum is. That's the above ground. Underneath the plaza is the memorial. So Kyle and I take the kids and we get on the, the you know, escalator down and you go down past the slurry wall where you encounter these fire trucks flattened like a pancake. All these relics and memories from that day. The most powerful is probably the stairway to heaven sometimes called the survivor stairway. It's the set of concrete stairs that people escaped on uh, in Vesey Street, and they put them right there. So as you're going down, you see these destroyed stairs going up. Super powerful memorial dedicated to those who lost their lives and those who heroically sacrificed theirs. Now, you understand what a memorial is, don't you? It makes sure you remember what you better not forget. Now, let me share something with you. Here's what I believe about prayer. You may forget at times what you've been praying for, but God never forgets. He says, your prayers have come up as a memorial offering. In fact, as you pray regularly for those close to your heart, day by day, it's like you're building memorial to God. It's like prayer by prayer by prayer, brick by brick by brick, and it's beautiful to God because it honors him. See, there are times that you and I forget what God's done that just started with some simple little feeble prayer. We see God do something over here and we completely forget that it was years or months before that we prayed over there. In fact, maybe it was someone else who was even praying for it. We fail to connect the dots between the two and give God credit for our answered prayers, you know? That's why, next to my Bible, the second most sacred book for me 
is this. <laughs> it's my prayer journals. I've got dozens of these. I started journaling my prayers and my thoughts about 10 years ago. I took it out this morning and opened up. This is 2015, May 30th. That was the exact date I wrote down in Liquid at the Shore. This is so fun. Lord, here's my prayer. It's 24 hours before our first ever Liquid at the Shore. I'm sitting on the boardwalk with my Bible, my coffee, and a pork roll sandwich. <laughs> Jersey, baby. Over 4,000 of your people are going to descend on Ocean Grove, a summer beach town of a square mile founded by Methodists in a spiritual retreat. And now it's made up of old-time Christians and gay couples who share a love for Victorian homes and manicured lawns. Our state is so quirky, but I love it, Lord. Thank you for planting me here, Jesus. You determine the exact time and exact dates for us to live. Nobody's moving from the South to save Jersey. It's up to us, and we're about to go for it. That's May 30th, 2015. Connect the dots and how God did things that we can't ask or, or imagine. See, without writing it down, you tend to forget. But God says, I never forget. And your prayers daily are building memorial offering to me. Let me personalize this. I had a grandpa. Andrew Van Emberg was his name. Hey, great grandpa too. This is a, a Jacob Castlander. It's my mom's dad. I know he's a little bit stern looking there, right? But you see him, he's like doing a Bible study or something there. Amazing man. Uh, Dutch guy. He always wore a three-piece suit, which was sort of weird to me as a kid. But he led the choir at our church, kind of big influence in my life. And Grandpa Andrew loved the Lord. And one of my earliest memories was Grandpa Andrew praying for me by name when I was nine years old. On Sundays, we used to go over my grandparents' house for dinner. Anybody else do like Sunday sauce? That kind of thing, get the family together. And I remember the time we finished dinner, they were clearing the plates, and Grandpa called me over to the dining room table. He said, little Timmy, come here. Now, let me just say, he can call me little Timmy. You call me little Timmy, you call me big Timmy, okay? That's, just his, that's his name for me. And he said, sit down. And I sat down, I thought I was in trouble, and he put his hand on my head. He must have been 70 years old. And he prayed over me, and he prayed KJV. He's like, I pray that thou, O Lord, I beseech you, would you bless and protect little Timmy and you anoint him to preach your truth and speak it to his generation. Let me tell you something. He's nine years old. That's a powerful thing. When you have a man, a grandfather, praying a spoken blessing over your life when you're nine years old. You, you ever have something happen in your life that God does and you know you, didn't, you had nothing to do with it? <laughs> you didn't even deserve it. You're just reaping the benefits of what someone sowed a long time ago. There have been moments in my life where I believe God has said, Tim, the prayers of your grandpa and your grandma are being answered right now. Here's some good news. Our prayers don't die when you do. There's no expiration date on prayer. Prayer is so powerful beyond time and space. It ripples into eternity in ways you don't understand. That's what happens with Cornelius. He says, hey, your prayers came up as a memorial offering before God. And then he says this, now send men to Joppa to bring back a man named Simon who's called Peter. When the angel who spoke to him had gone, Cornelius called two of his guys and a devout soldier who's one of his attendants. He told them everything that happened and sent them to Joppa. Now just pause here because this is significant. Because Joppa is right here on the map. You see Caesarea up here? Here's Joppa. And it's, how long is it? 32 miles. And none of you are impressed, right? Because we're like, big deal, man. I hop on the parkway, the turnpike, I'll be there in 20 minutes, right? That's how fast I drive. <laughs> but did you know this? In the first century, the average person, the average person in the first century never traveled outside a 30-mile radius of their birthplace. They didn't have trains, they didn't have buses. People walked where they went, and there was this like 30-mile boundary that they naturally fell into. But Joppa is how far? 32, just beyond the boundary, 32 miles, which I think God's making a point. If you're hungry to see God do a new thing in your life, you better be willing to step outside your comfort zone and step beyond the 30-mile radius of your experience. So many Christians, I find, pray. They want a new vision. You know, God, give me new dreams for our family, my, my career. I want fresh revelation. But don't break me out of my usual routine. What I've found is it's important to kneel in prayer, but there is a point at which God asks you to stand up and I want you to take a step of faith that goes beyond the boundaries and the limits of your experience. Let me give you a good definition of faith if you're taking notes, point three. Faith is taking the first step before God reveals the second. 
I don't like that. I want God to reveal the 25-year plan, but no, son, he don't work like that. 17 years ago, God revealed to me a single step. Tim, I want you to leave your teaching job and start a ministry. My family had doubts. My wife had doubts. I had some trepidation. But we took that step of faith together. Didn't know how it would turn out. Ten years ago, right, God told me, hey, I want you to launch a church with others. You know, Pastor Dave, Pastor Mike. We had enough money to last three months, right? Church in a hotel. People are like, that ain't going to work. I'm like, you might be right. Seven years ago, the Spirit led us to start different campuses so people could reach their neighbors closer to where they live. And then three years ago, all those people got together under one roof, and God answered a prayer and presented us with a 165,000-square-foot warehouse, enough room to create a broadcast campus to serve our current campuses and launch dozens of new ones in the years to come. But guess what? Even just stepping into this place required a step of faith. I mean, as exciting as Liquid the Shore was, honestly, we didn't have the money to renovate it, right? Just leasing the building was a stretch. Renovating it, you know, warehouse into a worship center, that was like pff, mind blown. Buying it was out of the question. I couldn't get my head around it. We're talking millions of dollars, and I believe in prayer, maybe not 10 million of them, though. <laughs> but our leadership team, we got together, we prayed, we sensed the Holy Spirit confirming that vision. We took a step of faith before God revealed the second. That's how it works. God will not hand deliver you a 25-year strat plan, strategy plan. Everything spelled out. You may wish he did, right? We prayed the Lord's Prayer in opening worship. Love that, right? Give us this day our daily bread. We wish the prayer was, God, give us this day our yearly bread. I would like a year's provision, please. I'd like a year's revelation. But he ain't going to answer that prayer because why? That would keep us from having to actually live our lives in this place of absolute dependence on God. And that's part of his will. Did you know that? That you would come to him for your daily bread, your illumination, seek his face, open his word, taking the first step in faith before he reveals the second. That's what faith is. Prayer has to be coupled with this willingness to step outside our 30-mile radius, our comfort zone, and follow God, trusting that he'll reveal the second step before we fall. I have a friend who, uh, this week, he left the corporate world for ministry. And I said, dude, that's amazing. So they're bringing you on there full time. He said, well, I gotta raise my own support. I'm like, I'll be praying for you. Like, that's a big step, you know, without revealing the second. I said, I, he said, I don't know how God's gonna provide Tim, but I trust God's heart. By the way, can I just say this? God may call you not to like leave your job for ministry. He may call you to leave ministry for the marketplace. And guess what? That's just as holy. God's answer isn't always, you know, leave your job, go to seminary, become a pastor. You have a different story. And in prayer, he may distinctly call you to something else. He may call you to start a business, to leave the corporate world, to do something risky and start a business on your own. He may call you to, to, to move to a new state or city and you don't know anybody there to pursue your passion or use your talents. Or he may just call you to start a family and be a homemaker. All of those things are holy, 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 holy things. Amen? Faith is taking the first step before God reveals the second. Cornelius... He just stayed in Caesarea. Nothing happens. But he steps and goes to Joppa, 32 miles outside his comfort zone. And this is where he meets a guy who was worlds away. It's a man named Peter. This is where we are in the story. We saw this one man over here in Caesarea praying regularly. Now watch what happens when two people pray. Watch this. About noon the following day, as they were on their journey approaching the city, Peter went up on the what? Roof to pray. Now, can I just ask a question? When and where do you pray? Like most days, you know, is there like a dedicated time and place that you go to talk to God? For Peter, it says, okay, it's usually about 12 noon. He goes up on the roof. Maybe he wanted a tan. I don't know. He just wants the sun, you know? The reason I ask when and where do you pray is because here's the deal. If you can't quickly answer that question, my fear is your prayer life may lack the consistency that it could or should have. Let me illustrate it this way. I want you to imagine, you know, a friend comes up to you. John's in the first row, one of my buddies. I say, hey, uh, hey John, let's, uh, let's get together this week. And you're like, sure, how, what time? And I just say, whenever. And you're like, okay, cool, what, where do you want to meet? And I just say, wherever. John, what are the chances we're going to get together? Zero, right? When people say whenever, wherever, it's their way of saying, how about never? Does never work with you, right? 
That's never gonna, that meeting ain't going to happen because it lacks a specific time and place. And you know what? If we make an appointment, it happens. What's true about human relationships is true about your spiritual relationship with God. If you want that conversation to mature and deepen, you have to follow the example of Peter and make a dedicated time and place to speak with the Lord. His prayer time was 12 noon on a roof. Yours can be different. Me, I can't wait till lunchtime. I meet with God first thing in the morning. Typically, it's on this bench in our kitchen. If I go, I go downstairs and it's cold, and what's, what's cool is underneath the bench is this built-in radiator, and I warm my tush on it. You know, I love it, in the winter at least. And that's where I spend the first 15 minutes of my day. I open my Bible. I invite God to speak. I journal what he's impressing on my heart. Now, for you, it may look different. In fact, you can have some fun with this. On Wednesday, I took a little survey of our pastors at Liquid. I said, hey, when and where do you typically pray? Send me a picture. I said, snap a picture with your phone. Let me show you. This is where Pastor John prays. He goes out for a jog. He said, at 5.30 in the morning. I'm like, that's why he's thin. I... I <laughs> He said, Tim, I used to wear headphones, but I realized I talk with God while I run. And he said, there's something beautiful about being outside when the sun's like coming up and everything's waking up. He said, I feel God's presence the most. This is Pastor Jason's recliner. Uh, he said, I switch up the location, but a lot of times it's this brown chair at home. How many of you have a place at home? You got like a chair or a room that you typically go to or pray. That's a good thing to have in your house. Kind of establishes a routine. This one is my favorite. This is Pastor Karen's kayak. She lives on the lake, okay? Nice to be rich. I, 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 I just kidding. I see her over there. She's like, what? No, no, I'm just kidding. She said, I, Tim, I'm a first thing in the morning prayer. I live on a lake, so my favorite is taking the kayak out in the summer uh, where I just listen and talk to Jesus. Very powerful. And then there's one pastor who won't be named. His initials are Keon. He said the place he prays the most is his car. Anybody else pray in their car? like on the way to work or school. I, I, like, do you close your eyes, Doug? What do you, <laughs> just a little word of advice. It's not in the notes. Don't close your eyes or else you meet Jesus real quick, all right? Just saying. <laughs> you need a time, you need a place to be with God, to spend time in his presence, share what's on your heart. But listen, listening to what's on his, to let him set the agenda, this is so important. Mark Batterson has been so helpful to me on the topic of prayer. I can recommend his book, Draw a Circle. And Batterson writes this, he says, one of the biggest misconceptions about prayer is that it means all outlining our agenda to God as a divine to-do list. God, do this, do that, heal this person. The true purpose of prayer is to get us into God's presence so he can outline his agenda for us. See, prayer is not about outlining this laundry lists of requests, you know? God, help me get the promotion at work. God, heal this person. God, fix my marriage. So many of us treat prayer like we're ordering from a menu, right? I would like an extra side of blessings, please. Hold the pain and suffering. That's great. <laughs> you know what? Prayer can change circumstances. That's true. But true prayer is when we let God change our heart, our perspective on the situation. One of the places where God changed my perspective, just, you know, personal, I was out in the parking lot here in Parsippany, after the realtor uh, showed us this building, we walked around the parking lot, actually walking around this building praying like in circles, you know, just like Peter on the roof. People must have been like, what's that crazy dude doing, you know, waving his hands. But before any of this happened, prayer came first. Before we started construction, we said, we got to cover this place in prayer. So I want to show you one of my favorite photos. If you're new, particularly, it's going to be kind of cool. This is a picture of liquid people writing the names of unsaved family members and friends on the floor of this church before we did any construction. So right now, under your feet, under the carpet, are thousands of prayers. Does that make a difference to you? To know that you're sitting, you're standing on the prayers of thousands of people. We had people from our campuses write the names of their friends and family on the wall board. So wherever you see wood, there's names on the back of it. And it's a permanent reminder, we built this church for them, people who aren't here. So when you're in here, we got prayers under our feet, we got prayers over our head. Now people walk in today, we got like 800 just new people just showed up and you're like, it's kind of cool. God changed a warehouse into a worship center. But the way I see it, you're not just sitting in a church, you're sitting in a miracle. This place is a memorial to the power of God to respond to heartfelt prayers of his people and pour out his favor in a way that shows when people come together to pray, God can do a miracle in the middle of them. This is what happens when Peter gets up on the roof to pray. Look at this. He became hungry. He wanted something to eat. And while the meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. Anyone else get in a trance when they get hungry? 
That's a different sermon. He saw heaven opened, and something like a large sheep being let down earth by its four corners. And it contained all kinds of four-footed animals as well as reptiles and birds. And then a voice told them, get up, Peter, kill and what? Eat. Now watch this. Surely not, Lord, Peter replied. Can I translate that for you? No way, God. You ever have an argument with God? You talk to him and then, oh boy, he's talking back. No way. How'd that go for you? <laughs> Let me tell you something. You win an argument with God, you lose. <laughs> but if you're willing to lose the argument with God, you win. As your pastor, I believe some of you are like one lost argument away from seeing God do something spectacular in your life, something special, something new, something fresh. But you got to be willing and humble enough to lose an argument with God and say, God, you can change my mind. Can I ask you that? Does God have permission to change your mind? Does he? Because sometimes through prayer, God changes our situation, but he often uses prayer to change our heart, to get us to think new about a situation. You know, five years ago, I'll take this middle journal, I had a hunger for to see, really see the Holy Spirit move in our church in a way I hadn't seen. That, you know, people wouldn't just come and say, cool, you know, message and music, I get that. But just like, holy smokes, that was God because those guys aren't smart enough. <laughs> and so we started praying in our church, you know, for the sick. Remember that? Laying hands on people, anointing them with oil. And God just kind of grew my faith because I was like very uncomfortable at first. I was like frozen chosen, right? A little bit about the religious straitjacket. But then I saw, as we stepped out in faith, God heal people. Woman walk out of her wheelchair. Guy get his hearing back in. And he, that's the, it changes the way I pray. So fast forward to last Sunday. After the service, my family goes out to eat at a diner. And I'm like, okay, whoo, all right, church. Wow, it's an amazing day. So I go, I'm going to use the restroom. And as I'm walking to the restroom, this old woman, probably in her 70s, sorry, mature woman, so sorry. Don't send me an email. She, come, she, come, she comes hopping back by the bathrooms, an older woman with a, another, it was her daughter, underneath her. She said, oh, you okay, Mom? She goes, oh, it's my leg, it's my leg. Jesus, it's my leg. Now, she wasn't praying. You know what I'm saying? She's like, oh, and I'm like there, and I'm like, hey, what's going on? She just goes, I have a Charlie, it's my leg. It comes, it just crip, it's crippling and everything. And I'm like, man, I'm done with church. <laughs> Surely not, Lord. We're right here in the diner. I'm not going to be weird about it. And I'm like, all right, God did this. I want my, he changed my mind. I got to be open, exercise your faith. All right, God, I'll, all right, let's do this thing. I'm like, I'm not a doctor. I said, I'm a pastor. Can I pray for you? And she's like, oh, sure, sure, please pray. And I didn't even think about it because here, I just put my hands on people because we're in church. We're in a diner. And so I'm like, all right, here we go. Boom, on her head. And you know where I put my hand, boom, back of her leg. And I'm like, in Jesus' name, I ask that you would just release this muscle. And I could feel it like twitching underneath there and everything. I'm like, is that better? And the woman next to her, she goes, it seems like it's relaxing because she's putting her leg down. I open my eyes and she's just looking at me. <laughs> like, and I can see her eyes darting like, should I call the cops, right? Because like a stranger, <laughs> it's kind of weird. Now, why do I do that? Because I want to keep growing forward in faith and taking new risks for the gospel. Because if you don't exercise the muscle of your faith, it grows weak and it atrophies. God changed my mind about the power of prayer to heal, and I don't want to go back to him about the arguing about it. I just want that perspective and my, my worldview now to be permanent. And God is about to put a jackhammer to Peter's religious thinking in his religious straitjacket. God's like, you're praying, Peter, I'm going to change your mind about something, specifically your cultural bias against Gentiles. See, Peter is a Jew. He lived his whole life observing Jewish dietary laws, right? You can't eat certain foods, right? Like the meat of animals. But while Peter's praying, the Holy Spirit says, hey, look at all these animals on the sheet. God said, you can eat them. And Peter says, surely not. And then he says this, my whole life, I've never eaten anything impure, unclean. He's like, no way, God. I ain't eating what the Gentiles eat, that, or the Romans eat, those impure pagans. He has a strong reaction. This is like saying to a vegan, hey, you want to go to Zinburger? <laughs> we'll get some Kobe beef caramelized onions, a little truffle oil. P.S., I feel like we should anoint with truffle oil because that is the nectar of heaven, is that not? <laughs> Everything is better. You see what's happening? 
Peter's praying and God enlarges his perspective. See, prayer always enlarges your perspective. We have a limited view, but prayer gives us a God's eye view. It's how God moves you from stale thinking to fresh revelation. Peter's vision was God's way of saying to him, don't you look down on the Gentiles like they don't matter to me. They're not inferior. I created them in my image and I value their souls as much as yours. I love them like I love you and I sent Jesus to save them just as I sent Jesus to save you. Brand new thought for Peter. Blew his mind because Christianity at this moment is really a sect of Judaism. There are all these traditions surrounding it, right? Food laws, circumcision, that the non-believing world knew nothing about, but the Jews were like, we are the chosen people. Everyone else is racially inferior, but God's about to change the rules of the game, amen? He says, I'm gonna change your mind, Peter, and I'm gonna break through your racial barrier because two people are praying, Cornelius and Peter, a Roman centurion and a Jewish apostle who should never have met Never been friends, never come together, but watch, a miracle's about to happen in the middle. It says, the voice spoke to him a second time. Don't call anything impure that God's made clean. And this happened three times because God's like, did I stutter? And immediately the sheet was taken back to heaven while Peter was still wondering about the, the meaning of the vision. The men sent by Cornelius found out where Simon's house was and stopped at the gate. And this is fun because you, you, you see, right, this divine appointment starting to materialize. Roman soldiers, Jewish fishermen, they don't hang out. They're not friends on Facebook. They don't follow each other on Insta. So society said, they're enemies. But when you follow Jesus, I'm just telling you, you're gonna meet people that you have no business meeting. God's gonna ask you to do things that is beyond your ability. And Jesus is gonna take you to places that you couldn't get on your own because he says, I'm gonna order the steps of my people. And he said, I prepared good works for you to do in advance. And when you pray, God is faithful to enlarge your perspective. He'll get you where he wants you to be, but you have to be humble enough to let him take the lead. It says, they called out asking if Simon, who was known as Peter, was staying there. So while Peter was still thinking about the vision, in other words, he's reflecting on it. The spirit said to him, Simon, three guys are looking for you. So get up, go downstairs, and don't hesitate to go with them because I sent them. Well, the next day, Peter started out with them, and some of the believers from Joppa went along. And the following day, he arrived where? In Caesarea. So now Peter steps out of his comfort zone and goes 32 miles. Cornelius was expecting them, and he called together his relatives, his close friends. And as Peter did what? See this together. Entered the house. Pause. Understand something. It seems like a, no big deal. He enters the house. When Peter walks through this door, he is about to break a whole list of Jewish rules. He is crossing a major threshold spiritually. This is no ordinary door. This is like stepping through the wardrobe in Narnia, okay? It's like everything's going to change after this. Christianity will never be the same once you step across this threshold. The rules of the game are about to change. So he pushes past his awkward feelings, his straight-jacketed religion. He steps through the door, and he said to them, you are well aware like everybody knows this, that it's against our law for a Jew to associate or visit with a Gentile non-Jew. But watch. God has what? Shown me that I should not call anyone impure or unclean. In other words, he says, I've been praying and I had a fresh revelation. God just revealed something to me. He's changed my perspective. I've been a religious racist. I've been, we're ethnic elitists and that's wrong. So I'm going to step past my background and watch this. You're going to preach here. Then Peter began to speak. I now realize how true it is that God does not show what? Favoritism. But he accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. You know the message God sent to the people of Israel announcing the good news of peace through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of who? Lord of all. All the prophets testify that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. And while Peter was still speaking the words, the Holy Spirit came on who? All who heard this message. And suddenly the barrier is busted open. And Christianity is open to all's y'all. Guys, this is the tipping point in the kingdom of God. 
Up to this point, Christianity, little sect of Judaism. But two men start praying. God gives fresh revelation. He directs their paths to actually cross, and they each go beyond their comfort zone. It's like zzz, a bolt of electricity happens. The Holy Spirit comes on all of them and changes the course of Christianity. Cornelius and his whole family, they put their faith in Christ, and the door to salvation swings wide open to the Gentiles. I know, some of you are like, well, that's sort of cool. No, you don't understand the significance. Show of hands, how many of you here today are not Jewish? You're not Jewish. Raise your hand, okay? Overwhelming majority. Let me just ask this. How'd you get in the game? How, how are you in the game? Who let you in? What, why do you get to follow Jesus today? If Cornelius didn't get saved them, you wouldn't be saved now. As a non-Jew, your spiritual genealogy goes back to this breakthrough moment that started with two people praying. So understand, when two people pray, don't be surprised when a miracle happens in the middle. At Liquid, we believe the Holy Spirit's still speaking, amen? Jesus still works miracles, amen? That means anything's impossible. What's impossible with man is absolutely positively possible with God. So let me ask you what you're praying for regularly. Are you praying for a, a relationship to be reconciled? It seems beyond repair. I don't know if it... Lean in. Lean in and pray. God, I don't know how I'm going to get the money for schooling. I, I really feel you calling me. I don't know how you're going to make it work. Lean in and prayer. What seems beyond your ability or that's bigger than your perspective, you could never do on your own, God can do in one moment more than what you could accomplish in a lifetime, but it all starts with prayer. I want to close with something cool. Two weeks ago, we had a major milestone as a church that I wanted to tell you about because only a few people are aware of it, but I was like, you know what? We should really celebrate that as a family. You guys know we completed construction on... Uh, Parsippany here in the fall. We had our first services on November 5th, a little over a couple months ago. Wonderful celebration, right? Then we had Tim Tebow. It was awesome. But behind the scenes, God's been answering another prayer because when we acquired the building, it was through a lease, right? We we're going to lease the church for 15, 20 years. But then we we're praying about it and we're like, you know, if we're going to pour all this money and time and energy into transforming a warehouse and a worship center, wouldn't it be awesome if we could buy it? I was like, surely not, Lord, right? It seemed beyond anything we could do, so we started praying, and we've been praying about buying it actually for a little bit longer. We've been praying for about two years now. Well, I'm excited to let you know, church, on January 5th, we closed on the purchase of this property, and you are now proud owners of this entire building. That's amazing. That's God. The whole thing, you own it. 11 acres. 165,000 square feet. That's a legacy for generations to come. You own it all. That, my friends, that's the power of prayer. You understand? That's the power of God answering thousands of prayers of people fervently on their knees, asking him to move. And guys, when I, when I was nine years old, I had no idea my grandpa's prayer would turn into something like this. I think you understand this is all Jesus. Anything good that has happened in our church has started in prayer, this entire journey. With all its ups and downs, none of it's explainable in human terms. It's the power of God working through the prayers of you and me. So let me ask you this. What obstacles are you praying about right now? What miracles in your life are actually just a prayer away? Where do you need God to change your mind and enlarge your perspective? Remember what we learned today. When you pray regularly, irregular things will happen on a regular basis. The more you pray, more God incidences. Because prayer releases the favor of God. What's favor? Favor is the difference between the best that we can do and the best that God can do. And faith is just taking the first step before God reveals the second. So is God calling you to take a step today in an area of your life? Maybe he's been nudging you about a change in your careers or to stay where it is. I don't know. He wants to open your view with fresh revelation because prayer enlarges our perspective. You widens your circle and you see what's possible with God. And understand when two people pray, a miracle can happen in the middle because Jesus made a promise where two or three, my followers, get together in my name, guess where I am? Right in the middle of them. And so today as a response, we're not gonna sing a song. We're just gonna invite you to come forward so we can pray together, pray with you.
I mean, I know every single person, every campus, you got a different situation. God's writing a different story. Maybe you're here and your family's facing a big situation or a challenge or struggling with a decision. You're not meant to face them alone. We not only preach about prayer, we actually practice prayer at Liquid every Sunday. So I want to invite our campus prayer teams to come forward at every campus, let you know who these guys are. They are trained. They are men and women. They're ministers of God who are here to come alongside you. We were praying before you even got here. And we're just going to create a little space now. It's going to kind of end our service. But if you feel like, man, I'd love to have someone pray with me, you come up after I close in prayer. And we'll pray for you right now, right here. We're going to pray for God's wisdom, his discernment, maybe give you clarity if there's a confusing situation you're facing. Just pour out his favor. Maybe, I just had this thought, maybe you're like Cornelius. You're new to this whole Jesus thing. Come on down. Let us pray for you. Because prayer doesn't just change the minds of men. It moves the heart of God. Amen? Let me pray for us. Father, I ask now, as people come forward, would you speak quietly? Would you confirm, Lord, things that you've been whispering to your people about? Would you bring wisdom that dispels and clears the fog of our own selfish thinking? Lord, I thank you for the ways that you've worked in our church. I thank you, Lord. It so outpaces the size of our puny prayers, what you do. Bigger than more we ask or imagine. And so God, I pray that you'll do more than people ask or imagine as they come forward. I pray that there would be healing that we could only attribute to the power of Jesus in this place. Lord, I pray that there would be steps of faith confirmed in the heart today and that people would leave full of faith to move boldly forward tomorrow, Monday morning. We ask that all our decisions bring maximum glory to Jesus and spread the gospel and saturate our state for him. It's in your name we pray. Everyone said?